Hi. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I am lucky enough to um, present this year's alumna award to Sarah Brennis. Um, she's been a frontline fighter in immigration and humanitarian issues since graduating from law school here. She spent time working at a bunch of other jobs, but then I met her at the immigration clinic, and then since then she went on to work at Advocates for Human Rights. She started at Advocates as a staff attorney where she recruited, trained, and supported pro bono attorneys representing asylum seekers, and was recently appointed director of the Refugee and Immigrant Program at Advocates. So through that work, she's still continuing to support um, attorneys that are representing asylum seekers nationwide. I always remember her telling me that our clients were really courageous. Um, our clients, when I was in clinic, they were asylum seekers and people who had had these horrible things happen to them. Um, and when they applied for any sort of immigration benefits, they had to recount these terrible stories over and over and over again to the students, to the lawyers, to the judges, to basically anyone who asked. And um, these stories were really painful and always brought up really um, their personal tragedies and the risks that they took and everything that they had to leave behind to come um, in the pursuit of safety. And if that's not courageous, I don't really know what is. Um, she's always been able to look past individual cases and see the actual client there. And she's just changed lives in the last, I don't even know how many years. Um, she trains, trains and encourages attorneys nationwide. She's represented people in court. She, su she supervised students, and she's just really made a difference in our community. So please help me in congratulating Sarah on being this year's Alumna Achievement Award recipient. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and recognition today. Um, I'm trying not to get emotional, but <laughs> for those of you that are with me doing this work, you know that it's, uh, it sneaks up on you. So, <laughs> um, When I was a kid, a well, young kid, my mother promptly corrected my father when he speculated whether or not my sister and I would go to college. She told him, my girls will go to college. She insisted and she made it happen. I grew up in an era when Title IX was no longer in its infancy. I was introduced to basketball when I was in second grade and saw girls hockey come to be a thing when I was in high school. And this fall, or this spring rather, I sat and watched our Minnesota Lynx claim yet another WNBA championship with my daughter Cecilia, who's here with us as well and is eight. And just as I didn't really think twice about how significant it would be for me to go to college, I'm sure my daughter thought, well, yeah, the Lynx, they're winning again. This is perfectly normal for me. When I was a kid, my mom was soft-spoken but relentless in her efforts to expose us as girls to everything, to art, to language, to dance, to sports, to academics, and we were just in it, going to and from activities, not realizing that many of these things we she couldn't have done when she, was a, when she was a kid. And my mother would never let me sell, sell myself short. She encouraged me to find the most challenging career I could, and I think I did. Um, and sometimes I wonder if she was really paying attention when we were kids, because when my sister and I would argue, she would always win and consistently negotiated me out of access to the phone, shotgun in the car, first dibs on the bathroom in the morning. Um, yet in typical lawyer form, I always felt that drive to keep myself busy, to push to the next goal, and to be successful in life, which I think many of us in this room share. With age, which next year I will be officially in the middle of, comes the humbling realization that successes never come from one's individual efforts alone. My career has not focused on winning groundbreaking legal cases but rather on securing life-changing legal protections for the immigrant clients that we serve. I could not have asked for a better mentor to learn how to achieve this goal than Professor Virgil Wiebe, whom I had the honor to work with for three years as a clinical law fellow in the Interprofessional Center's Immigration Clinic. 
Virgil's helped train hundreds of law students in the field of immigration and has consistently instilled in us the importance of putting clients before our careers. In serving them well, we serve our profession. I'm honored, honored and humbled to partner and work alongside so many of Virgil's former students in the UST community, grateful for Juliana, and proud to see a former student working alongside me representing immigrants in our community. My mentor, my, one of my law school mentors, Summer Sharif, um, who led our Amnesty International chapter when I was here, and now I get to work alongside as she helps uh, recruit pro bono attorneys at Robbins Kaplan. We've worked with her out at the um, airport, helping individuals who are affected by the refugee travel ban, and now helping find pro bono attorneys to represent immigrant clients in bond proceedings. My colleague, Allison Griffith, and I now doubled the size, the number of UST alums that are at the Advocates for Human Rights. And her endless energy and dedication has been a source of optimism in a time where we thought it couldn't get much worse for immigrants. She's helped provide our program with the energy it needs to be determined to do more to help the immigrants and refugees that continue to seek protection in the United States in spite of the e increasing number of detainees being held in our jails and the plummeting number of refugees that our government has committed to receive. With a commitment of receiving 45,000 refugees next year, it will be the lowest in US history, less than 1% of the world's 21.3 million refugees worldwide. There are many other strong and successful alumni colleagues that join me in this work. Graciela is here, and there's a long list of others who have come through the University of St. Thomas and are, and are out there working with immigrants. Yet I believe we'd all agree that the most inspiring women are those who we serve through our legal representation. In my work, the women who've reclaimed their independence by fleeing domestic violence, women who've reclaimed their bodies by escaping cultures where they and their daughters are subjected to female genital mutilation. Women who've reclaimed their sexuality by fleeing governments and vigilantes who have made it illegal or impossible for them to choose who they love. And women leaders in journalism, in medicine, in business, in politics, and in law who have stood up to oppressive dictatorships, violent rebel groups, and corrupt government systems. These women courageously faced the reality that it was time for them to flee. It was time for them to reclaim their present day and lay claim to their futures by seeking asylum in the United States. These women, our clients, are an inspiring reminder that it is also our time as women to lay claim to our futures and to that of our legal profession. Of the 900 Nobel Prizes that have been awarded, just 48 have been awarded to women. 30% of those awarded to US recipients are immigrants, I'll also note. 45% of women associates are women, yet only 22% are partners and 18% are equity partners. Minnesota is beating some of the odds. Half of our Minnesota uh, 10 judicial, judicial districts are led by women, 43% of the district court judges are women, 53% in the Court of Appeals, and 57% in the Minnesota Supreme Court facing a national average of about 31%. I was born at a time when 20% of the law graduates were women. Now we're over 40% of those graduating law are females. I'm grateful to receive the award today and accept it not as a recognition of what I've accomplished, but a validation of what we all aspire to achieve. And my work means the safety for immigrants and refugees whose futures we strive to protect, and as well the success for ourselves as women lawyers, whose time is now, and who, with the support of each other, we can continue to do our work and see that it is not unquestionable that the future is open and the possibilities are endless for our next generation of female professionals. Thank you again for this award. It truly is an honor to be receiving it today and to continue this important work that we're all doing on behalf of, of our clients and ourselves as women.
Well, good morning. I'm Nicole Fredericks Jackson. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and also Student Life here at the University of St. Thomas School of Law. At this time, I would love to welcome our panelists to join me on the stage, and I will uh, briefly introduce all of them. And Sarah, congratulations. It's a well-deserved honor, and thank you for all that you do. Any places behind? And please feel free to keep eating. <laughs> well, welcome. At this time, I would like to take a moment to introduce you to all of our panelists, all of whom have graduated from the University of St. Thomas School of Law, and we're very thrilled to have each and every one of them. Directly to my right is Elizabeth Grand, who's a graduate of the class of 2004. Elizabeth supports the Risk Market Specialist Team at Thomson Reuters. In this capacity, she leads three specialist teams focusing on regula regulatory screening and enhanced due diligence, compliance training and regulatory intelligence. Prior to Thomson Reuters, Elizabeth worked for the Gerritsen Resolution Group and Analytics, working with class action and mass tort litigations. Elizabeth started her legal career as a judicial law clerk for the Honorable David Duffy in Hennepin County, and later as an associate for Ford and Harrison, focusing on labor and employment litigation. In 2015, the Women in Sales organization named Elizabeth the best woman in financial sales for North America. Elizabeth is a CEO, Circle Award winner, team MVP, and consistent top individual contributor. Law and Politics recognized Elizabeth as a rising star in 2007. Elizabeth is passionate about increasing diversity in the workforce, in sales, and in sales leadership. Uh, and she is also a Bikram yoga instructor. Next to Elizabeth is Erin Bryan, class of 2008. She is a senior corporate counsel in the law division of U.S. Bank, where she, where she supports, um, where she provides legal support, excuse me, to U.S. Bank's mortgage and consumer lines of business. Prior to joining U.S. Bank in 2014, Erin was an associate in the finance and restructuring group at Dorsey & Whitney, where her practice included a wide variety of transactions transactional matters and bankruptcy litigation for clients in the financial services, healthcare, technology, and, and energy industries. She began her legal career as a ju judicial law clerk for the Honorable Robert J. Kressel, United States bankruptcy judge. Erin was recognized in 2014 as an up-and-coming attorney by the Minnesota lawyer, and this year she was recognized as one of the National LGBT Bar Association's 40 best LGBT lawyers under 40. Next to Erin is Amanda Bloomgren, class of 2006. Amanda is an attorney and founding partner at Bloomgren Hansen Legal, which she started with fellow St. Thomas Law alumna, Katie Hansen. They opened the firm in 2011 with the goal of providing client-focused legal services. Amanda's practice areas include family law, real estate, small business issues, and general civil litigation. Amanda is also an active member of the Chaska Rotary, where she chairs the Chaska Rotary Ga Annual Gala and is past president. She recently joined the Minnesota Medal of Honor Memorial Board. She remains very active in the St. Thomas Law community, serving as a mentor, a JD Compass career strategist, and a director on our alumni advisory board. And in her free time, she enjoys laughing at the antics of her toddler, Eli, and her chihuahua, Biggie Smalls, my favorite name ever. <laughs> and helping her husband, Tomas, grow his custom shoe business. And if you've not seen these shoes, they're fabulous. Next to Amanda is Tasidra Jones, class of 2012. Tasidra is passionate about pursuing social justice from the intersection of creativity, both art and entrepreneurship, law and education. As an entrepreneur, lawyer, and former performing arts educator, these sectors are important to her and help her better relate to the communities that she serves. Prior to joining Intermedia Arts, Tasidra served as the manager of business inclusion and business compliance for the city of St. Paul. There, she sought to be an advocate for, a, for local, small, small minority-owned and small women-owned businesses. 
She seeks to help those with a vision and dream gain access to the tools needed for economic prosperity. Currently, Tasidra advises and consults with public, private, and nonprofit entities from her intersections. As an artist, Tasidra has written, produced, and directed award-winning works focused on raising awareness about community issues and creating policy solutions for such issues. Welcome. I am uh, thrilled to have all of you here today, and I look forward um, to our discussion. When you think about leadership, where did leadership um, kind of grow out of and begin for each of you? Um, why don't we start with Elizabeth? Sure. I have one question first. Actually, Absolutely. Yep. Okay. For the people in the audience, I'm curious to know how many are students, how many are alumni? So students, raise your hand. Alumni, raise your hand. Wow. Okay. It's about 50-50. <laughs> Of those who are alumni, how many of you are in traditional legal careers? Okay. Non-traditional legal careers. Okay. So I fall in the non-traditional legal career. Uh, I think I've probably taken the most non-direct uh, of most people in our class. Um, so for me, I'll, I'll kind of tailor my, my remarks um, to, to more of the non-traditional world. So I'll, I'll start with Thomson Reuters. I'm at Thomson Reuters today. I've been there for about five years. When I started at Thomson Reuters, one of the first things that I observed was that there was not a single woman between me and the CEO. In my direct line uh, of chain of command and direct reporting, there's not a single woman. I was new to Thomson Reuters. I was looking for someone to emulate someone to look up to, and I had a strong line of white men. So at that point, for me, it really came down to, okay, I can't find someone here. Can I find people externally? And then also, what are the traits that I would like to see in someone I would like to look up to? And how can I develop those in myself? So that's kind of the, the context which, for me, was the awakening of, of finding a leader. The, the second point in that, and the real point for me, which is why I'm here today and the role I'm in, comes down to a very specific moment this spring when we had a bunch of our senior leaders at Thomson Reuters on a panel in New York City talking about how to hire and promote diversity within the financial world. My manager's manager at the time was really big on um, WhatsApp. So we would have kind of team chats. And the team chat for that day was, how can we as leaders hire and promote for diversity? And to my great embarrassment, again, the mainly white male leaders on the team, their main comments were <laughs> my favorite. Hire from the military, because that's where you'll find strong women, uh, women, female leaders. Start a group. Go with millennials. Go to colleges. Find and you know start groups. And, and really, all the comments tended to focus around other people's actions, other people's groups. Well, what can other people do? And not a single person said, "What can I do?" So I added some comments on, do a gap analysis of your team. Who's on your team today? Where do you want it to be? What can you do to set yourself up to hire for success? I then <laughs> reached out to other women on my team to say, will you please chime in? One person didn't. The second woman uh, responded the next day. I reached out to my manager at the time to say, could you just support me? Say, I agree. <laughs> nice work. Um, and it was really that specific moment, which was this spring, which allowed me or gave me the sense of urgency and confidence to say to our manage managing director, like, <laughs> we need to change this. There is a need. <laughs> I'm here. I've been trying to do this. 
and I need your help to get a role to do this. So for me, it was a very specific, poignant example, and going to the right person who has the authority to help put somebody in those positions, and two weeks later, I had the position. Thank you, Elizabeth. Erin, can you share with us a little bit about your awakening? Sure, I think for me, um, the theme of my professional development, kind of starting in college where a lot of us start to become aware of what it is we think we want to do with our lives, um, it's really been a theme of showing up and raising my hand and not waiting for somebody to reach out to me and say, you're the person who should be doing this. Um, you know, this is what we see for you, but really being willing to put myself out there, um, even if I'm not sure that people are going to agree that I'm the right person for the opportunity or that I have the right qualifications for it, um, but being willing to take that risk that some of the time I'm gonna succeed and some of the time I'm not, and that's okay. Um, so, you know, one example of that, um, last year, I heard about an opening on the Bankruptcy Practice Committee for the District of Minnesota. And this is something that, um, you know, every year they look for a few members of the bar to step forward and serve on the courts committee. And a big part of their work is, um, is reviewing and creating local rules of, of practice for the bankruptcy court. And when I looked at the other members who were serving on it, I thought, this is a real long shot. <laughs> I'm probably you know, a little too early in my career to be putting my name out for something like this. But on the other hand, this is something I'd really like to do. Um, so I put my application together and sent it in and um, didn't really expect that it was going to happen, but hoped that it would. And in this case, um, it did. And I had that moment when I got the letter saying, yes, you can be on this committee, of just feeling um, like, I'm really glad that I took the risk and did that. Um, and it, if I hadn't raised my hand and, and taken that opportunity for what it was, it wouldn't have happened. Um, of course, there have been other things where I've put my name in and it hasn't worked out. There's been leadership opportunities where I thought maybe I was a better fit. Um, and you know, for whatever reason, others were more qualified or you know, um, had the right characteristics for it. And it's sometimes hard to take those setbacks, but I try to take a long view of it and say, you know, as long as I keep trying for these things, um, I'll be able to find some of those opportunities. And in the long run, you, know, you don't remember the ones that you didn't get. You remember the career that you've been building. Amanda, moving to you. Well, I think that definitely uh, my awakening came with the decision to move forward and go out on my own with uh, my own practice along with Katie. And Katie's here and she thinks I'm going to tell the story about how we traveled to DC and her baby had a blowout on the way through the uh, <laughs> security because that was our awakening that we could do this together and have a practice together. Uh, but I think one of the real moments um, was actually something my mom shared with me that my dad had said uh, when I had made the commitment to open my own practice. He said something, and I'm emotional about it a little bit, but he said he didn't think I was gonna be able to do it. And he thought it was dumb. I was leaving a job that uh, I was on a partnership track. I could have uh, stayed there. I could probably be there today still. And he thought it was a crazy move. And um, I, he, he's a loving dad and I, he's a champion for women. Uh, but I think some of it came from uh, his kind of generation and the generation of staying in the same uh, job and career forever. But what I thought about and reflected on with that is what is it going to take me to be able to do this? And in, I, I had to go research this and figure out how to formulate and, and say this to you all, but um, in looking up the concept of self-leadership, I think that's really uh, what was the awakening that I had. And uh, in researching self-leadership, the three things that I found as defining were the idea of self-awareness, which is more of the kind of internal uh, awareness of uh, what drives you and kind of your passion. And so that's one of my focuses is trying to kind of work on my self-awareness and how I move forward um, in my career with that. Second is self-confidence, the ability to um, know your strengths 
uh, understand your weaknesses. And the last one, which I think is uh, really the most poignant, is um, self-efficacy. And that's the willingness to know that if you go ahead and do something and make the commitment based on those first two points that you're going to be successful, that you can do it. It's the drive that gets you through the really scary court hearing, uh, gets you through the difficult conversation with the client, gets you through um, not knowing whether or not this uh, big leap that you're taking to do something with your life is going to be successful, but having the confidence that at the end of the day it will be. Um, and it's been the best decision that I've ever made. Uh, I like to tell people that I don't think there's a job somebody could offer me that I would take because I'm so happy in the decision and the dry and the ability to, to do the practice that I have. So I'm glad I took the leap and I'm glad I didn't listen to my dad. And my dad was at least smart enough not to tell me directly. It was the <laughs> so. To Cedra. Well, good morning, everybody. It's like quiet in here. Good morning. <laughs> Yay, thank you. Uh, so it's, and it's great to be on this panel and just hear everybody else's stories and reflect on my life. Um, honestly, for me, I grew up in a house, and I was blessed and fortunate to have wonderful elders in my community and my family that really planted a lot of seeds of wisdom growing up. And one thing as a kid, there are a lot of things they said that at the time I did not value or appreciate or would argue about, but as an adult really appreciate now. For instance, my dad, when I was a, a very young, he would always say to us, you need to learn how to take the initiative. If he came home and we left like a bag of chips or something on the counter, he would just see it and say like, take the initiative. You need to learn to put it back. And he would just tell us a lot. You need to know how to see something to do and do it. And I also grew up with elders in our community who talked about the value of helping out your neighbor, helping out those who you see who are going through difficult times and how that's important. Regardless of what you're going through, if you have the ability, the gifts and the talents to make a difference, you do what you can. And so that's, that's, been, that's the foundation for how I've really lived my life. And so I, I provide that first to say that in many of the situations that I've been in, I've never necessarily thought about myself in that sense of being a leader. I just saw something to do and I did it. And so from that perspective, um, an example I can give would be when I was working with this city, many times I was in these situations that I, would never, I never would have thought myself to be in rooms with governors and mayors and sitting around the table and looking and seeing that I'm the only person of color and the only woman in the room and the youngest person in the room. And to be able to be in that position and ask questions about what certain communities needed, that was a moment where it's as much as I may be afraid or terrified or not really know if I'm saying the right thing, what I do know is that the prior week I talked to this community of small minority women businesses and they were saying that they can't get economic opportunities. They've tried these processes, these laws and policies are conflicting with their ability to navigate complex government systems. It needs to change. And to be in that position and know that that's what I needed to do in that arena. And it honestly wasn't until um, I was leaving this city that a few people, once I had let folks know, I started getting emails and texts from folks just saying, you know, we're going to miss your leadership. And it was in that moment like, oh, well, I was just doing what my dad told me to do when I was six. <laughs> you know, <laughs> seeing something to do and doing it. And, and that for me, I'm constantly growing and learning from the wonderful mentors and colleagues and friends I have around me and stepping into more and more this, this role and what leader means at this chapter of my life. Thank you. So one of the things that I've heard a little bit throughout um, just your awakenings is a little bit of that concept of not knowing, right? I think that's one of the things. I know I ch I'm challenged by it. I suspect there are some women out here that are challenged by it also. It's the concept of feeling like you need to know everything before you jump in, right? And so how do you, how have all of you kind of taken that and not needed to know everything and gone ahead and, and ventured into the risk and, and kind of into that unknown and had the confidence and the courage to go forward. I can start. Go ahead, Amanda. Well, I actually think that one of the things that law school teaches you is in part the skill and the ability to do that. Uh, I think that that concept behind the Socratic method and all the stuff that was so uncomfortable in law school, uh, the reason for that in part was to give us the ability to navigate situations where we don't necessarily have a 
um, answer to the problem when we walk into the situation, but we have the confidence and ability to figure out the situation. I, I rarely walk into the courtroom and know what's going to happen, but I have a concept and ability to understand the 52 things that, that might happen and know that I'm going to be able to assess the six options in front of me and make the best choice for my client. So I think that, that I think law school has uh, provided all of us that skill, or that's the intention of uh, what um, law school is attempting to teach us. And it's just the ability to have the confidence um, to go out there and do that. Uh, the other thing I think is having um, a trusted group of people around you that you can ask questions of that you can kind of do it in a no judgment way. I've got friends, um, some of them in this room, that when I don't have any idea what's gonna happen in a situation or how to navigate it, I call them up and say, how do you think I should argue this? What do you think I should do? And frankly, the best answer is that they don't know either, because at least that gives me um, some confidence that I haven't missed the answer, that it, is a, it isn't a black or a white and I've missed it, but it is a gray. And so finding those people that you can rely on and have those conversations with, I think I also think is really important. I really agree with that. My, um, my group of friends from law school has been incredibly important to me every time I've had a new decision to make about steps to take in my career. And it's been really great also to be on the other side of it and be able to be someone who's providing support to my friends as they're navigating really difficult decisions about you know, whether to take a job, whether to leave a job, whether to, you know, um, step back for a while to focus on something more personal or, you know, set some of the personal things aside to really um, focus on advancing in their career. And I get so much meaning out of those conversations and so much energy. Um, one, of the, one of the women who I went to school with um, was recently considering making a major uh, career change and going from um, not being in private practice to considering being a, a partner in a law firm. And this was a huge change for her and something that she'd never really considered, but the opportunity came up. And um, so she, you know, called all of us up and said, can we get together and talk through this? I'm really not sure if this is a good idea or not, and I don't know if I'm qualified. Um, so we, we got together and I think everyone had been kind of independently pumping her up and saying, you can do this, you're exactly what they should be looking for. And you know, not any kind of you know, false optimism, but because we really believed in her and had seen what she'd done so far in her career and thought, this makes a lot of sense, you should be open to the opportunity and you can decide later whether it's the opportunity you want. Um, so you know, from that initial stages, you know, then we, we gave her feedback on her resume. We got together and did a mock interview with her, um, kind of regrouped after the first round of, of informal interviews and kept talking about it. And, um, you know, all of the different considerations that go with that, you know, is this what you really want to be doing? Is it going to be better than where you are right now? Um, are they valuing you the way that you should be valued? You know, is, is the compensation that they're offering you, is that appropriate for what you're going to be bringing to the table? And um, I, I think if you have those people around you that you trust and you can give each other feedback and support each other and really um, champion each other's careers, it, it not only gives you a sense of security that when things aren't going well, you're gonna have people there for you, but it just gives so much more meaning to the work that you're doing to be able to see people around you succeeding. Right. Let's talk a little bit about that support piece. So I've had the pleasure of hearing you speak before, Cassidra, so you've come to a few things here at the law school. And one of the things you've talked about is having your own personal board of directors, which I think kind of goes to this concept of, of having support, having people in your corner. Can you kind of talk about your definition of the board of directors and, and really kind of you know share with that share with us a little bit about that absolutely uh, so I don't know I can't remember exactly when it all began but in every major chapter of my life I've had the privilege and honor to meet just phenomenal people who have been exceptional mentors and become great friends and through that I, I know let's see 
going all the way back to college, I had this one professor um, in sociology who just was great. She just took me under her wing, and she was probably the first um, person without having that phrase attached to it that she became a part of the board. And so when I was applying for law school, I actually had people across sectors who were a part of this committee helping me get into law school. So I had people who were English majors and writers. I had folks who were attorneys. I had folks who were judges reviewing every aspect of my application and doing interviews and asking me where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do, so that I presented the strongest thing forward. And what was great about this are these are folks who care about me and who love me, but they were also brutally honest. <laughs> that was probably the most challenging first step of my life, where these people were like, this is good, Cassidra, but we're going to tear you to shreds. <laughs> and they really did. They, they tore every aspect of everything I wrote. Like the first thing that came back from like all of them, which just read everywhere. And I was like, OK, so I know you guys love me. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, but it made me a better person. And I say that to say that with the board of directors, you want to vary the people that you have in that circle. You don't want yes people. You want people who are going to be honest with you and can be real with you and let you know the truth. And so I have people who are at my same, you know, the same place where I am in my career, coming out of law school. So those colleagues and friends. I also have folks who are much older than me, and those folks who are kind of getting close to the age of, of retirement who are on this committee, who have really lived and they've done a lot. And then I have people who, well, you know, might not necessarily consider them to be the, the closest of friends, but they're colleagues who I can have great conflict with, but I know that they are passionate from their perspective, and it can also help me to think about things that I wouldn't think of from the perspective that I present. And depending on what scenario I'm going through in my life, I will go to this board, this group of people, and I'll divide it out, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, and I'll ask them questions. So when I was looking to change jobs, I talked to my friends who were in colleagues and mentors who were lawyers and asked for their perspective. I talked to those who worked in government to get their perspective. And then I talked to people who were in, oddly enough, I don't know how I started meeting a bunch of people in finance, but there's that group. And that's, that's a blind, it was a blind spot for me in terms of understanding certain aspects of finance and figuring out where I wanted to go if I was going to run a business, if I was going to do this, that, or the other. And it's just great to have those different perspectives of people who will tell you exactly you know, they'll tell you how they see it. And the thing I appreciate is that it often end, it's, it's really your decision uh, in the end, but these are the things that we're seeing are your blind spots, these are the things we're seeing are your strengths, and these are things that you might wanna, you know, consider. And so that's been really helpful throughout my career, not to mention the elders that I have. I spend a lot of time with like 70 year old women. Um, I might be a 30 something, but I do, I truly am an 86 year old woman on the inside. Uh, <laughs> And so I really have a great time with my 80-something-year-old friends, <laughs> and they have a lot of wisdom to impart as well. I always find that those that have the wisdom have also always been willing to be very honest with me, <laughs> which is nice. Um, oh, absolutely. Please do. I'll just add one thing to that. The board of directors is a fantastic concept, and to do that and use it. Another thing just to be really aware of uh, is the difference between mentors and sponsors. Are you familiar with the difference between a sponsor and a mentor? So I would say mentors are fantastic. Include mentors on your board of directors. But as far as advancement and achievement and different roles, the importance of sponsor, sponsors is invaluable. And as far as, and really what a sponsor is, is somebody who is in your corner that is helping to drive different roles, positions, and advancement. So it's, it's very specific. It's very um, intentional as far as how they will help you move your career along. Um, and an example of that for me, the, the whole reason I really wanted to win the Women in Financial Sales Award was because what it came with was the ability to have a mentor slash sponsor with the senior most woman at Thomson Reuters at the time. So I met with her once a month for a year. But having someone in your corner that is speaking to senior leaders, kind of greasing the path for you to take those next roles, those next positions, um, is instrumental in, in moving up or around in organizations. Have others of you had those sponsorship opportunities? And can you share with us an example of it? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I would say that 
uh, let's see. Actually, I've been really, I've been really blessed. <laughs> you know, it's moments like this. You're sitting up here thinking about your life, and you meet a lot of wonderful people. Um, yes, I would say when I, I was coming out of law school, I had an opportunity just after law school to work with um, the International Leadership Institute, and at that time with retired Judge the June Lang, and through that work, who I met through Dr. Artika Tyner, and so having that opportunity at that time, I was able to work with them, and it provided opportunities for me to go to Kenya and work with the government there, merging my passions, and she was the one who opened created those avenues to say, hey, I'm advocating for Desidra to go from here to here. And likewise, after that experience, another um, St. Thomas alum opened the door for me with opportunities with the city and really advocated for me to get in there. And he kind of passed the baton to the next person that really pushed for my, my moving forward. So I've ha I have had those advocates really pushing for me to go through doors that I would have otherwise thought as being very much so closed and outside of the range of what I should be looking for. Yeah, the, the most influential sponsor that I've had so far, um, as my clerkship was wrapping up, there was um, a partner at Dorsey and Whitney who had just lost a mid-level associate, and she was looking really hard to find somebody who had any amount of bankruptcy experience to come in. Um, and she knew that I was approaching the end of the clerkship and called the judge that I was clerking for and said, is it okay if I approach her about a job? <laughs> and um, at the time, I had not really considered going to a big law firm. That was not something that had ever been um, been on my wish list. Um, I went to law school thinking that I, I wanted to work at legal aid, and you know somehow I've ended up at a bank instead. But um, <laughs> but so she she approached me, and. Um, and I was really nervous about it for a lot of reasons. I was nervous about going to a law firm and what that would mean for my life. I had, um, I had a two-year-old and a new baby. <laughs> so, you know, everything that I'd heard about big firm practice made me think this is probably a terrible idea. Um, and then in addition, I just wasn't sure what that culture would be like and whether it would be a place where I could keep my values and, and still feel like I, I was the person that I wanted to be. Um, so I was coming into it with a lot of reservations, but when I met her, I also saw something th that made me willing to take the risk. And what I heard her saying was that she was really looking for somebody to come in, not just to fill this immediate need, but what this other associate had been was someone that she really wanted to bring up in the firm. She saw this person you know, becoming a partner and being someone that she could really work with on her cases. And so when this associate decided to leave for a really good opportunity to clerk for a court of appeals, um, she thought, you know, I'm not just looking for somebody to do the work, but I'm trying to find somebody that I can really, um, that I can really support and bring up with me too. And it was, it was that that made me willing to take the risk, um, as scared as I was of you know, the lifestyle changes and you know, also worrying that I wasn't gonna be as smart as these other students who had graduated you know, the first in their class from Harvard or whatever. <laughs> you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but um, you know, their recruiting was really intense and I never would have gotten in the door through OCI. So I had some, some reservations there too. But she was very reassuring and said, you know, you can do this work. Just work hard and take the feedback. Um, and so that's what I did. I went in and I worked really hard for her. Um, and every time I turned something into her, I proofread it three or four times. Um, I talked to other people to get a sense of what it was that she was looking for. And I did everything that I could to become someone who was reliable for her, that she could trust me with the work for her clients. Um, and in doing that and you know, showing that I was you know, someone who wanted to work hard and who wanted to fill that spot, you know, in turn, she continued to give me more exposure to her clients, give me better opportunities to work on, on cases that she knew that I wanted to be working on, um, giving me more challenging work so that I could continue to develop, introducing me to the right people at the firm that I was going to need in order to keep growing there. Um, and by, she ended up leaving the firm to take a, a judgeship, but by the time that she had left, she had laid so much groundwork for me 
but I wasn't afraid of what was going to happen next um, because I had those relationships now. I had the confidence in my work. I knew where it was that I was going, at least in the short term. Um, and it was really because of, of her sponsorship and taking me on and saying, you are someone specifically, not just who I want to give advice to, but who I want to help advance. And it was really an incredible gift. And I'm glad that I was able to, to take the risk and step forward to do it. Well, when I think a little bit about the sponsorship piece, I think some of that also goes with creating your brand, right? Kind of figuring out who you are and, and what it looks like uh, for you to come into your own as a professional. Um, what have you done uh, to create your own personal brand? And, um, you know, what has that looked like as you kind of create who you are as a professional and as a leader? Amanda, I know we talked a little bit sure. about this. Um, well, I was listening to a podcast a couple of uh, weeks ago, and um, someone was speaking, and they actually were quoting someone else. So I'm going to be quoting someone who was quoting someone. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, but what the woman had said was something to the effect of the worst job interview advice I ever got was to be yourself. And then she followed up by saying, if I was going to be myself, I would show up in my pajamas and my Uggs. And what really that statement is supposed to be is you need to be authentic. And I think that in this figuring out how to brand yourself and working with your professional development and um, kind of over time, how do you become more authentic in the work that you're doing and bring yourself into it more? Um, everybody has a little bit of a personality, a different personality, a different style. How do you start to, as you get more confident in the work that you're doing, um, integrate that into uh, the work that you do? Uh, a good example for me is I'm somebody that my clients tend to know my cell phone number. My clients, uh, I'll, I'll call somebody at 545 as, um, or 530 as I'm leaving to pick up my kid and I have to pick them up at 6 o'clock or they start to charge me $15 a minute. And once it rolls to 555, I say, hey, I got to go. But then I, they know that about me. They respect that I've been willing to give them that time. I also might give them time in the evening. They know more about me, and I'm willing to do that. I think other attorneys take a harder, um, you know, clean line in what they're willing to have their clients know about them. I've been willing to open myself up a little bit, and I think that that um, has created a little bit of a brand for me in the sense that my clients um, have a relationship with me. They know a little bit more um, about who I am. Uh, Katie and I office, for example, in a big room that we joke is just like those rooms up there, the um, big study rooms. Uh, we used to study or we study in rooms like that together and now we practice in a big room like that together. So clients walk into our office, um, into a storefront office and walk into an environment where they see where we work. So they, they see who we are and that's kind of um, part of our brand. Um, over time you have to figure out what that looks like in the courtroom. I jokingly was um, saying that a couple of weeks ago I wore red pants and cheetah shoes to court. And um, <laughs> it was, but it was a court that I'm completely familiar with. I knew all of the people. Um, it, it felt right. And then later on, I was like, it, actually, I walked into the office, and Katie said, "You wore that to court." Uh, <laughs> uh, they were cute little shoes. They weren't. It wasn't obnoxious. But I, but I, as I'm developing my practice, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to integrate my personality into what I um, do, and I'm trying to gain some more confidence in that. Um, so people know who I am as a part of my practice, and I'm not just practicing law. Thinking about the corporate setting, how does brand play out for either of you as far as your own personal brand and what you want to achieve within your company? I don't know about you, but I hear brand all the time <laughs> <laughs> from everybody as far as working on your brand. And I actually, I think, Amanda, you said it best when it comes to authenticity. One of the best books that I've ever read is called Unbecoming a Leader by Warren Bennis. Um, and everything I've ever read or learned myself about leadership, become your best person, whatever it may be, you know, brand, et cetera, comes down to authenticity and figuring out who you are, what makes you special, what your gifts are, what's unique about you. For those of you that had uh, Judge Toussaint, 
How many of you in the room had Judge Toussaint for evidence? It's a handful. Um, well, if any of you remember, he handed out, um, I guess it's a poem, Our, Our Greatest Fear. Mm -hmm. And I think in creating your own brand and creating authenticity and creating who you are and what you want to be known for, it starts with uncovering and embracing your own unique gifts and who you are and what makes you unique and special because you can't make it up. So if you can do that, then really embracing that and being comfortable and owning it um, within the corporate space mm -hmm. is, it is really what makes it important and believable and actionable. Um, I, yesterday I was at a, a women's event sponsored by Thomson Reuters in Chicago called Risky Women, and it's a group of compliance professionals. And one of the, yeah, it's really cool. It's international. It started in Asia and Hong Kong. We now have chapters from San Francisco to Boston to Toronto to Europe. Um, but one of the women on my team, um, I, I think, was probably one of the first uh, African American female leaders at Thomson Reuters. Believe it or not, I think she was one of them. And she said the best thing I have ever heard. She just made up her mind that she belonged. And going back to brand, whatever your brand is, she just made up her mind and she said, you know what? I just decided I belong. And if other people don't get that, I'll give them the space. They can figure that out, but that's them. That's their, 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 their issue. So a little bit of a um, roundabout way, but, but brand is really important. But I think it comes down to figuring out and embracing who you are and going with that. For me, since being in-house, there, there have been two kind of defining um, aspects of trying to figure out what is my brand as an in-house attorney. Um, one of the first things that I wrestled with and that I keep wrestling with every day, and I, you know, I will as long as I'm in-house because this is central to the work that you do, but trying to figure out you know, where is the line between me saying, I am here just to provide legal advice and that's it, versus I'm here to provide the legal background and also help my clients think through what the legal risks mean for them and how that's going to inform the business decisions that they make. And I noticed right away that there was a wide variety of philosophies on how far you should go in this. You know, there were some attorneys who said, I am a business partner as much as anything, and yes, I'm aware of, you know, the privilege issues, but I'm not providing value to my clients if I'm not also giving them business recommendations. So that's on one extreme. And then the other extreme is, I am only here to advise on what the law is. I don't want to cross the line into providing any kind of business advice because that is not my role. So, um, you know, in terms of how my client, my internal clients see me, that's probably been the most fundamental um, concept that I've had to struggle with is to figure out how, how far do I want to go in being part of those discussions versus just saying, well, this is what the law says, go figure out what that means. And for me, I think I'm somewhere in the middle where I do want to be part of those discussions. I don't want to drive the outcome. So, you know, I don't want to go into a discussion thinking this is what the business has to do and my job is to convince them of, of what that is. I try to really step back and be impartial about it, but I do think that there's a lot of value in being part of those difficult conversations. Um, and that's something that I become more comfortable with and is something that I, I do want my clients to, to seek out from me. Um, the second thing was really just a moment that happened when I'd been at the bank for about a year and I'd been working on a project that was really sensitive where it felt like there was really no outcome we could choose that was going to be um, you know, unequivocally best for all of our customers. And so that was a really difficult thing because you'd like to think, you know, well, in any difficult decision, there's going to be a right answer and we're going to be able to figure out what that is and then we're going to do it. But um, that's not always the case. There's so many different considerations. And so I'd been working on a project with um, a senior business leader for a while and we'd been having a lot of these tough conversations. And we were on the phone and he said, I just want you to know I really appreciate your integrity and your perspective. And 
it was a moment where I realized that is what I want to be known for. So I actually wrote it down. <laughs> and I have it you know, written up in my cubicle um, as something to look at when I am having those tough conversations and wondering, you know, do I want to step back or step into this more? And I think as long as I feel like I'm still in touch with that, that I'm offering a useful perspective, but I'm also maintaining my own personal integrity, that's where I want to be, and that's the brand that I'm trying to cultivate. And that brings me a little bit to uh, how you see success as a leader, right? I mean, so it sounds like hearing uh, integrity and perspective. I mean, it kind of was, it kind of defined a little bit of what it felt to be um, successful um, in your leadership style. So how would others, um, including you, Erin, describe how, what it takes to be a successful leader, and how would you describe yourself as being a successful leader? What does success look like? I suppose I can go. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like there's this pause and everybody looks this way. <laughs> All right, I can do this. <laughs> uh, well, you know, success, here's what I'll say. When I was younger, coming out of college, I had this idea and this concept of what it means to get there. And uh, as an artist and a writer, a playwright, and I, I wanted to write something about what it means to get there. Like at some point in your life, you have to get there, whatever that there is. And the more that I work, the more that I grow and learn and I'm on this planet, that there just keeps moving. It keeps evolving and it keeps changing as you keep growing and evolving and changing. And so I say that today to say that success for me uh, three years ago is different than success for me is today as a leader. So three, four years ago, or when I came out of law school, success for me would have been to find a job where I was able to be a whole person in one space. I got to be a lawyer, an artist, an educator, and change the world. And it happened. I was able to do that. I got that job, and that was great. And now, what's next? <laughs> you know, and it's kind of like, what's, what's the big vision? So I think, for me, success, big picture from a life perspective for leadership and the leader that I'm, I'm hoping to continue to grow into and be in the course of my life is one who is truly making a difference in the community around me, somebody who's authentic and somebody who is listening to those voices and those people who often don't make it to the table and allowing that in having had heard those conversations that I'm not sitting there silenced if I have an opportunity to be at the table. And so that for me, if I'm able to continue to do that throughout my career, uh, that for me would would mean success. Mm -hmm. So I'll speak to just the work part of success. It, it assumes that every, my life, et cetera, is in order. But, but for me, I think the legal field, per se, um, is far more diverse and equal than I think the financial world. So for me, success means staying in it. It means staying put. It means staying in the field and continuing to make a difference and advance. There are a lot of women, and there's no right or wrong reason or, or, or answer, but there's just a lot of women that leave at some point for various reasons. Um, and I think success is staying in it until you really have the ability to make a difference. Second part is to really that, to do that, to make a difference, to work with, to collaborate, to support, to inspire younger women and people in general within the workforce, there's a huge opportunity. I've seen this year more change, more momentum. It just feels like there's a new tide within the financial world. Um, but it requires people to stay in it. And so for me, personally within the workforce, that's what success looks like and that's what my commitment to myself and to those around me is to stay put. I agree with everything that both of you said. I think that's all part of it, and those are our feelings that I share as well. Um, in addition, I've, I've noticed over the last two years in particular that I'm starting to get a lot more satisfaction out of trying to bring other people up. And so 
you know, I am sure, you know, as Tessidro was saying, you know, the goalposts keep moving, right? You, you achieve one thing and then you think, okay, I'm gonna challenge myself a little bit more, or you, you know, become someone who's considered for something else that you wouldn't have been qualified for before. And so those opportunities change as you go along. But um, I'm starting to realize that, you know, now that I'm at this sort of early midpoint of my career, which is kind of scary to say, but <laughs> I think it's true, um, I, I have the ability to start bringing up other people with me and that's really exciting. Um, so, you know, as I think about the next 10 years, I wanna keep working on my own professional development. I'm definitely not <laughs> ready to step back and I have a lot of energy, but I'm also getting energized by seeing um, newer attorneys who have really big goals and wanna get out there and try things. Um, and so when I have the opportunity to, to feel like I have something that I can offer to someone it's incredibly satisfying. And, um, and I feel like you have the potential then to not just have your own immediate contributions, but to feel like, you know, I helped this person get to where they are and now they're doing all of these great things. Um, so one example, there was a, um, a junior associate at Dorsey when I was there who um, didn't enjoy litigation at all and was in the finance and restructuring group with me, but really stayed away from the bankruptcy litigation stuff. He just wanted to work on deals. And I was telling him how much I loved volunteering at housing court. And he ended up um, volunteering to, to start there too. And he's now at the bank with me. He came over a little bit after I did. But I see him at housing court all the time now. And you know, not just going for the clinic shifts, which you know is, is kind of the easiest thing to do when you're in-house because it's really difficult to take full representation cases without the support of a law firm behind you. But he takes full representation cases and he goes into court and he advocates for his clients. And um, it, it was such a huge feeling of having been impactful that I was able to inspire him to at least get in there and give it a try. Um, and so, you know, clearly his accomplishments are his own accomplishments, but there is that feeling that you're kind of planting seeds in different places. And now that I'm in a position to be able to do a little bit more of that, I think that's been a new focus for me and something that I'm probably gonna be continued to, focusing, to focus on at least for the next 10 years, and then we'll see what comes next. I heard the word satisfaction, and that's the um, thing that I think of when I think of success. And I think for different people, success is gonna mean different things. And I would truly speak to the half of the room that are the students with respect to this, because I'm sure many of you have um, already changed your um, intentions and paths from the first day that you walked into law school. I remember everyone on the first day of law school wanted to be an environmental lawyer. And on the last day of law school, they all wanted to be state planning attorneys, and most of them are neither of those things. Um, but the point being, I think the question that you need to ask yourself is, in my, in my today, what do I want in the next five years? And um, finding some satisfaction in where you're at and staying in it and being on the journey and know that it's continually moving. And when I look at uh, my friends around me and where they would have been uh, at the time of graduation of law school and what they were thinking their five-year plan was, most of us are not doing that, but we're doing incredibly successful things and we each measure our success very differently depending on the trajectory of our careers. And so I think it's finding your own satisfaction and that's where you, um, you find your success because it's going to measure differently for different people and you certainly shouldn't measure yourself against the person next to you, uh, especially as you start to take on uh, family responsibilities and um, things that go on outside of your career, I think we measure success differently. And just because you're, you're not what you, you thought you were going to be getting that big law, law firm job and then you change your mind and you're going down a different um, trajectory, that's okay. You thought you were going to be in, uh, in legal aid and you're at a bank, you know? So everybody's path is different and it's finding satisfaction where you're at and being ready to move down the path to the next thing. I'll make one point on, on that comment though. One thing that was really helpful, because I, I practice law, I'm not practicing law now, 
is identifying where your interests, your skills, and your passions converge. So I think we've heard passions, interests, skills a lot on the panel. And as you really, really think about how you want to spend your day, what do you want to do? What are you just naturally good at? Are you a really good writer? Do you like to be in court? Do you like people? Do you like to be a little bit more reserved? Whatever it may be, it, it's worth some time thinking about where those come together. Ultimately, kind of when you're defining success and what makes you happy. Yes, Cedra. May I add to that? Just build on that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, I when you were introducing me, you talked about my intersections, and so I learned that concept of talking about intersections from another one of my great mentors, and the reason why I use that language is because when I was a law student and I was applying for <coughs> jobs, and um, my 1L summer I was going through a ton of different interviews, and the day before I was supposed to go do a full day of interviews, I went to this networking event and met with a woman who reviewed my resume. And so I majored in music and sociology, and I always had a goal of working with creatives and business owners. And so my resume at that time, because I was a first year law student, had like some of the things I had volunteered doing, but a lot of arts related things. The woman looked at my resume and she said, you need to take all of this off. No lawyer wants to work with an artist, and that will not work for you. So I was like, uh, <laughs> it's the end of the day, ma'am. I'm starting interviews like, 8.30, <laughs> what am I supposed to do now? Uh, so I went home that night really like, kind of you know, felt like I got a, a kick in the gut, you know, and so I thought about it over the night, I thought about it, I made some tweaks, but I kept the artistic aspects of who I was on there because that's who I was. And so I went into this day full of interviews and um, my first three interviews with really large law firms, the attorneys I interviewed with, one of them, the first one I went in, the woman looked at my resume, she was quiet, and she said, I want you to compare um, the founder's interpretation and your, your views of the founder's thoughts of the Constitution on X, Y, or Z with um, Bach and the first such and such related to music. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and so like, I did this analysis applying legal research and thoughts and language to a musical interpretation and had this conversation. Afterwards, the lady was quiet again. She goes, I was just so happy to see somebody else who majored in music. <laughs> I actually studied and I'm classically trained and I think it's phenomenal the way that music actually applies to the way that we think and our brains work as attorneys. I went into the next interview and it was a similar thing again with another gentleman who had an artistic background. So in the course of a day of like eight interviews, almost half of the people I interviewed with had other aspects of their life, whether it was creative or artistic, that they actually applied in their day to day. And what that left me with was realizing like, yes, I am an attorney, but there are lots of other points of who I am that intersect that make that little sweet spot of a Venn diagram, that's me. And that's who you are when you find that authenticity and you can't lose that because when you find that sweet spot, then that helps you to really show up as who you are in those interviews and on your job. Well, one of the things I've been hearing um, throughout this a little bit is also that opportunity to create leadership opportunities, right? Um, has there ever been a time um, when a leadership position wasn't available to you? Um, and how did you go about creating a leadership opportunity or an opportunity for yourself within that space? Elizabeth? I would just say, most frequently the leadership opportunities are not going to be available in the sense that there are only so many management jobs, there are only senior, so many senior partnership jobs out there, and eventually you'll get there, but I, I think that is the question, is how do you create leadership opportunities when you're either not in the position, because it might take a while to get there, or there's just not any available at that time. And a couple years ago, I was really ready to move into a leadership position, and there weren't any. There, there's only so many. So I think there, you know, one thing that I've done this year is we actually created a, a partnership between the legal business unit and the financial business unit at Thomson Reuters. And it's kind of a, it's a loose partnership, but it was an opportunity for me where I didn't have the manager title to really run and drive and hone a program that has ultimately turned out to be very successful um, and kind of dem demonstrate the ownership and the skills similar to a leadership position without having the official title. I quit my job and started a practice. <laughs> so, um, but, but in truth, uh, that, was, that, that was a reality in 
Um, I was getting to a place in the law firm that I was working at where in a mid-sized law firm you're typically um, at a place where uh, there isn't necessarily a straight partnership track, but at some, time, at some point those conversations start to be had. Often there's a buy-in of a decent amount of money. And the other thing in a mid-sized law firm that you're often doing is making a very committed decision to be a business owner with um, a select group of individuals. And I was facing that in the practice that um, I was previously at. I loved working with those folks. I still have great relationships with most of them. But I had to take a critical look at, are these the people that I want to own a business with? And uh, based on their business model, I was coming to the conclusion that not necessarily or ultimately what I realized is if I had become a partner there, I probably had seven to 10 years of effort and energy in order to kind of recraft what things looked like and to become a voice in um, that office. And I made a decision, do I want to take that seven to 10 years to build something that is my own or do I want to take the seven, and t seven to 10 years to, to redefine this and ultimately made the decision um, to go on, go on my own and figure out how to do it on my own and actually have um, total control um, over those choices. I think I could have gotten there with that group but I kind of looked at my choices and opportunities and decided to take that leap and truly create something um, on my own with Katie, so. I would, since about 50% of the people in the room are law students, I'll give another example from that time after I finished law school. So when I graduated from law school, the job market wasn't all that great, <laughs> and finding a job was quite a journey in and of itself. So I ended up having about six unpaid internships <laughs> um, across the metro, and then what I ended up doing, I had gone to so many networking events when I was in law school, and I wanted to work with creatives and small business owners, so I actually found all the attorneys I could who worked in those intersections. And I ended up finding an attorney who had started his own firm with another gentleman. It was a small firm that focused on doing intellectual property work and um, business law. And I met him for coffee. And what I ended up doing is putting together a proposal of why they need to hire me as a temporary law clerk until I um, passed the bar. And so what I ended up doing is doing the research in terms of what you would pay somebody to do that, what I can offer them, as well as my network from meeting with different people and demonstrating that I could bring in business. And if you do, only pay me for the business that I can bring in, and I promise I'll be worth it. And so I actually did that, and they brought me on. I didn't have a job, but I ended up getting something to float me um, and get paid a little bit. It was quite a thing to try and generate business <laughs> at that time and get them clients, but I was able to do that from the network of great colleagues and friends that I met in law school, but also some of the great professors who were like, hey, we have these people we can't help. It's like, great, let's try and funnel them in. And, and it ended up working out where sometimes if it doesn't look like there are opportunities, you, like you said, you really create your, your opportunity. You create um, where you're trying to go. And that was an opportunity to, to begin the, my, my legal career. And I think you uh, had used the term staying in it as well. I mean, I really liked that concept of kind of staying with it which I think is what I'm hearing um, from you as well. Um, speaking of the challenges and obstacles of just you know being an attorney, being in the law field generally, but also being a woman, um, women face many professional obstacles to leadership. And in your experience, what obstacles have you faced? You shared some of them. Um, but, and how did you manage to kind of keep your career on track and moving forward? Well, I would say mansplaining is real. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you are the most experienced or senior person in the room. Um, there will often be a less qualified man who is happy to share his expertise with you. And it can be really difficult to maintain confidence in the face of that over and over again. But, um, you know, I think having those female friendships, whether they're in your workplace or outside, to validate that, yeah, that really happened. Isn't that, <laughs> isn't that remarkable that somebody, you know, who hasn't gone to law school would educate me on what the bankruptcy code says about something, even though I've been doing this for 10 years? Um, so, you know, I think you have to have a sense of humor about it because it, it does still happen. And even well-intentioned people, we all have our blind spots. Um, but... <laughs> 
I, I think you know there is something to be said for trying to find environments where you feel like you can handle those challenges. I mean, it, it is important to know your limits, and there are workplaces out there that you know are not safe workplaces to be in, and it's it's okay to acknowledge that. And if you can change it, you change it. And if you can't, you have to take care of yourself and put that first. Um, but you know, having a network of people, whether it's you know men who are champion, championing your work or other women who are also supporting you, uh, is really important for that. Um, one of the things that really frustrated me in private practice was it seemed like no matter how hard I worked, a large percentage of people still thought that I was part time. And it, it made me crazy because I was thinking, you know, objectively, like I'm looking at the hours report for the associates in our group. I'm at the top of the pack. I know I'm putting the time in. I'm here all the time. Um, I'm really responsive to emails. And I would still have partners say, well, you're part time, aren't you? And after a while, I realized it was because I had small children. Like they were just making the assumption that because I had small children, I was there part time. It had nothing to do with anything else and it was kind of demoralizing but there's a reality to that that um, you know there is often a perception of women in the workplace that you know our our priority is somewhere else and you know just to be clear my kids are my priority but when I'm in in a work environment I'm there to work um, you know it's not <laughs> it's not a hobby or something that I'm just you know doing for fun so, <laughs> you know, you do have to hold on to that. Um, and, you know, like I said, I think a lot of people are, are well-intentioned and are not aware of the biases that they're bringing into it. And so it can, be, it can be helpful to try to continue to assume other people's good intentions, even though it can be really, you know, it, it can be tempting to just go into like, you know, they're just trying to, you know, break me down or something. And I really don't think that that's usually what's going on. It's just... Um, it's just kind of this unusual perspective of what it means to be a woman and working. And so for me, I've just had to hold on to, you know, I can be a good parent and also be a good employee. I can be advancing <laughs> in the workplace and also be, you know, a caring parent. Um, but there are definitely times that those have been challenged in a way that, um, has really made me have to, you know, step back and, and find my core again in order to have the confidence to come back. And how do you kind of, within the, you know, business and large firm environment, how do you professionally handle those remarks? I mean, other than knowing yourself and knowing what you are and, and what you want, how do you kind of help educate others or how do you help, you know, change that landscape? So they understand that you're there, not as a hobby. Well, at US Bank, and Katie Rialt is on my team. So hi, Katie. So I'm sure you can appreciate this. But you know, we have an in internal messaging system. And something that's been really helpful to me when I'm anticipating one of these difficult calls is to ask one of my colleagues who I trust to be on the call with me. And we can same time to reinforce each other on the call and, ampli and amplify each other's voices. And I found that to be incredibly helpful um, because sometimes, you know, the truth is it takes two women saying something to equal the voice of one man. And I hope that that changes, but I've been in a lot of meetings where that's the case. And just having somebody else say, yes, and Aaron said X, Y, Z, you know, to bring it back to that will, will help to, to get your ideas heard. So I found that to be really useful, and then also just providing moral support to each other when you're in, um, when you're on a difficult call that you don't feel like you're being heard, and you start to feel like you might be losing your mind because you're pretty sure that you just said that thing three times, and then somebody else says it, and all of a sudden people heard him say it when <laughs> they didn't hear you. So I think that's helpful, but you, I mean, you really do have to have a sense of humor about it because. You know, it's <laughs> it could really bring you down if you dwelled on it too much, and I just don't I don't want that to get in the way of, of me and my goals. Other advice from others on that? I would say leverage the fine gentlemen in your networks. 
Although there are a lot of men in the financial business unit at Thomson Reuters, there are also a lot of really good men. And I have had, I would say I would probably owe a lot of my success to the really good men that I've had in my corner. Um, one example uh, of just how it, I guess, to some extent plays out, I was on a team of all men and myself. And after, after the, the most recent new hire was hired to our team and they happened to be another male, I called my manager and I said, what are you doing? <laughs> why, why, can you please add some diversity to the team? Um, and he not only helped me get my position now, but the last probably three or four people that he, he has hired have been women. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I've actually received the most support from identifying the really, really good men in your networks. I can piggyback off that a little bit in the sense that I have experienced um, in my practice in litigation environments that I actually tend to have uh, better relationships and the better ability to um, interact more often with um, the male opposing counsel than the female opposing counsel. If I was going to define an obstacle, especially um, as a younger attorney, it would have been the female attorneys that were uh, a generation or a generation and a, ha a half ahead of me. Uh, I think that women were, were not necessarily great to each other sometimes, and there's that perception that the younger female attorney is not doesn't know what she's talking about. I guess maybe they don't think the men know the younger men attorneys know what they talk about know what they're talking about either. But I've had more conflict and felt less support and less um, just kind of. I feel like an older woman attorney often will not necessarily think that I'm on the same level as them where I feel like um, male attorneys um, tend to be more willing to find me on the same level. In what my goal is, is as I get to be an older attorney, because I think I'm approaching that middle, um, early middle career too, is that I don't become that person. And so I guess I would encourage everyone in the room that uh, is on the alumni side of things to be careful about that because I think that sometimes we can get to be a little competitive and maybe that mean girl spirit. I've had that, oh gosh, it's a baby attorney in my head before and I'm like, gotta, t gotta stop that because I was once that. Um, so let's quash that and you younger female attorneys, you know just as much as um, everyone else in the room, uh, male or female, and you can, do, you, you can do a great job and you just have to have that confidence. And I would just add, too, that part of that is redefining expectations for ourselves mm -hmm. and the expectations that we are, we are we're expected to be great. We're expected to help one another. We are expected to sit at the table. We are expected to walk into the CEO's office. We are expected to be great. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, lean in and something as simple as sitting at the table has been discussed quite a bit, but redefining Again, what's the expectation when you see a young female attorney in court, right? What's the collective expectation that we would like? And I would hope that it would be that you're supportive and encouraging and, and an understanding of what they're going through because we've all gone through it too. We need to try to bring them along better than um, we have before. I would just add, I would ditto a lot of the things that were said for me in terms of the difficulties component or those challenges that may come up. It has been largely age and then some of the female component, um, but often being one of the younger, if not the youngest female, at black, the youngest female person and only person of color in the room. So there are multiple levels there um, in those spaces. More intersections. <laughs> yeah, more intersections, <laughs> yay. <laughs> and so yes, often it's those three intersections that I'm sitting with in a lot of the spaces. But I would say, I would ditto everything that was said and then I would just add, um, this book that another woman, she's a surgeon and one of the first black female surgeons in her area that I met several years back. And she read this book called Hardball for Women. And it's a little bit older now, but there are some really good nuggets of information in there um, about going into these male dominated spaces and how to navigate that as a professional woman. Uh, so that's just a tool or resource that was helpful for me early in my career, along with talking to women who are willing to mentor not, to your point, having that competition because that sometimes does exist, but I would agree with what you were saying in terms of it not being intentional necessarily. I think sometimes folks, we can, people might think they're helping, but it's the way in which they're doing it that might not really come off that way. Uh, so that's all that I would add there. 
And I think that concept of bringing others up is, is so important, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you think about uh, women and, and those uh, that we want to help boost. And so what, um, what are you doing yourself to help bring others up behind you? I'm a little bit nervous to say this to a room full of law students, but I have never turned anyone down for a cup of coffee if <laughs> they <laughs> reached out to me. So, you know, I may regret saying that, but, you know, and, and I think you, you know, you have to be careful in approaching people. There should be some legitimate reason that you want to talk to them. You know, I'm interested in your practice area or you worked at this place and I'm considering it, you know, something, some sort of connection, not just an out of the blue, I'm looking for a job. but. You know, I'm, I'm always happy to meet with people. There have been a few people that I've met with that I've actually felt like where you're trying to get, I do have connections that can help you. I do have some, you know, wisdom I can share. Um, you know, there have been a couple younger attorneys who have um, come out of clerkships and been trying to evaluate their career options. And I feel like I've been pretty helpful in helping them kind of understand what the differences are and the types of um, practices they would have at different firms in the Twin Cities and you know what doors certain firms might open that others wouldn't um, you know what the reputations are of different attorneys at those places and I think that that's useful information that I've been able to provide um, so you know that's that's probably the the biggest direct way that I've been trying to give back is just through those being willing to meet with people trying to find areas where I might be able to provide some sort of support to them and trying to get where they're going, and then following up when I'm able to and providing some you know, ongoing moral support and, um, and insight to help them evaluate some of the options that they have. And then I would say I'm doing three things. So one, I'm now in a position where I'm able to hire people. So I genuinely believe that the most successful and best teams are diverse teams of across the board. So gender, thought, identity, whatever it may be. So I'm really committed to having a diverse team of my own. Second of all, when I was in Chicago yesterday, I committed to myself that whenever I'm traveling to the different cities that I go to, and I travel all the time, making an effort to connect with the women in those offices. There is a need within the financial community at Thomson Reuters to connect, promote, and enhance women. So whether that's a lunch, a coffee, or a dinner, proactively reaching out to connect with them to develop that community within Thomson Reuters. The third is I secretly love helping people get jobs. So <laughs> that is the best. <laughs> I really, really, really like helping people get jobs. I, I think I'm pretty good at it and I have a pretty good track record. So most recently, this is a little advice as well, but most recently a colleague of mine had a had a friend of his who really wanted a job within her space at Thomson Reuters. So he reached out to me. She didn't really know anything about who to contact, who the job was reporting to, et cetera. So I made a few phone calls. I identified the recruiter, the hiring manager, and the influences within the company, which at TR can be just identifying who the hiring manager can be a bit of a challenge. But connecting those dots and then following up with her, reporting back, she has an interview with the hiring manager in the UK this coming week. With that, what I, the advice that I would have there is when you are reaching out to people for jobs, for positions, identify a couple positions, whether it's a firm or a corporation, that you are interested because it makes it a lot easier for help. Instead of saying, hi, I'd like to meet for coffee, I'd like to, inter I'd like to connect with you, learn about, what you did, your story, and then maybe at the end of the conversation talk about a job. Be very specific in the sense that you're looking for jobs, you would like to understand more about their career, but give a specific position, posting, or job that then they can take action on identifying the recruiter, identifying the person that can actually hire you. Uh, I think that it's very self-serving but important that people that have something in common with me are successful. And I spend a lot of time uh, currently focusing on uh, people who are um, alumni at St. Thomas and being involved in um, the student community and the alumni community and helping folks along. I think that, um, and this 
again, was borrowed from somebody, I think Chris Wheaton said something to the effect of uh, the more successful uh, group of graduates we have that are out in the community being good attorneys, that raises the value of your uh, law degree and that raises the value of uh, the diploma on your wall. It's like a stock certificate. So the um, greater value that we can have in the community, the better. So um, I really enjoy um, not necessarily directly helping people get jobs, but helping people navigate and uh, work through uh, these choices and getting launched in their career. And I've really um, enjoyed the opportunities at St. Thomas to do that. So uh, for you alumni in the room that um, aren't involved, um, I'm sure Monica would be happy to talk to you about um, <laughs> getting more involved as with Nicole. So, but it's been really a really great experience and um, also awesome because as I see uh, uh, the folks launching into their careers and um, getting great jobs and moving on, um, I'm able to take a little bit from that too and um, have created relationships where uh, people are able to give back to me. And to that point and to the students in the room, the one thing I would say to you, the sometimes you're walking into a coffee or something along those lines and you're like, what can I give back to that person? This feels like I'm, I'm going in for an ask or I'm uh, taking advantage of uh, the little time that this busy person happens to have in the day. I truly would say that uh, the most valuable thing that you can do um, is give a thank you. Uh, and as you're moving on and have different milestones, also going back and taking kind of an inventory of the people that um, have helped you along the way and giving a thank you that might be six months, a year, two years down the road to say, hey, I just graduated from law school or I just got my first job and I wanna thank you for that role that you played six months ago. You might not have realized the impact that it had. When I get that feedback, that makes me want to do that more. Um, that makes me feel successful. That makes me feel satisfied. So um, so do that. That's all, that's all the students in the room need to do to say thank you to Erin when you ask her to coffee. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Um, I, I would just add from my perspective, I, uh, first I want to thank all the great people who helped me when I was a law student. You know, there are a lot um, here, like Dean Brabbit was somebody I met early on when I came to law school, and Dr. Tyner, Professor, Professor Levy Pounds, there's so many people here at St. Thomas that helped me understand just this area, because I'm not from Minnesota, I have no family here, no friends, no roots, I came here for law school. So figuring out how to actually navigate this place I'd never been to before was quite quite a journey and to meet people who took the time to sit down with me here, talk to me, help me understand this marketplace was huge. So I say that to say that coming out of an environment as somebody who knew no one and meeting so many wonderful people here, I find that to be something I have to do <laughs> for others if I meet anybody. So. I too um, will hesitate to say, but I will, that I have never turned anybody away either. Um, and especially when there are transplants and folks who are new to the area, I will go out of my way to sit down with anybody who's trying to navigate, whether it's government or um, the legal community uh, or the arts community, which are the intersections that I tend to work in. Um, I'm always happy to do that. In addition, every job that I've had, I've also created um, externship programs and opportunities for law students to work at those companies, um, as well as every semester I've brought on in any job I've had at least one law student to work with me on any kind of policies, procedures, or contracts, or big initiatives, regulations that I was working on as well. In our short time that we still have left, one of the questions I think I would, uh, I need to make sure I uh, tackle as well is, there's always that term called balance, right? I mean, what role does balance play uh, for us in this profession? And, and what does that look like? I mean, what, how would you define balance within your, your career? I mean, those of you with families, those with just busy lives, I mean, can you share with us a little bit about that? I'll start with, um and now I'm gonna forget the organization. But there's a really good organization that defines balance in seven ways. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it, it t it's like spokes on a wheel. And it starts with faith, family, friends, finances, future, fun, and fitness. And, and, and so there's seven Fs. And really what it does is it kind of has you gauge how you're doing in all of those areas. And if you're balanced, you have a wheel and the wheel rolls around, right? 
but most of us are a little bit short here, really good here, not so great over there. So it's more <laughs> like a, a square or you know, a little bit lopsided. So one of the best tips that I received from that leadership training mm -hmm. was really to take kind of an accounting of how you're doing in all of those areas and be aware of it. I mean, I started tracking it on a weekly basis and then it's kind of great because what you can do is you can kind of go and you're never going to be a perfect wheel every week, every month, but it can identify trends and it keeps you aware of, you know, are, are you fit? Are you making that a priority? How are you doing with faith? How are you doing with finances? Um, but it's a really good kind of checklist uh, of keeping yourself in the long term in balance. I think for me, uh, one of the things is to identify whether or not um, I need to compartmentalize those various parts of um, balance or whether or not they can kind of have an interplay. And I've realized for me to be satisfied, I need to have things be a little bit more um, mixed up. Um, I kind of mentioned that I'll have a phone call on the way home that my clients know about my kids, that I don't keep those bright lines. And I realize that that works for me. I don't think that that works for everybody. But part of um, the thing that I desired when I looked at going out onto my own was having the concept of kind of a seamless life where the various different elements of my uh, practice and what I really truly believe is my vocation kind of interplay with one another. So I don't necessarily have a firm set of boundaries with respect to the balance of my professional and personal life. But I realize that works for me. And I do know that I set some, I have some internal boundaries. Um, for example, I'm willing to say to my client, hey, I'm done, I'm hanging up the phone with you because my kid's crying. Um, I'm, I'm willing to, to there, there's boundaries within that seamlessness that I've created for myself, but I don't necessarily compartmentalize like that. I certainly see other people, um, and I think it's probably more typical to have things a little bit more compartmentalized where you say, I don't answer the phone at, um, after 5 p.m. I was just on the phone with an attorney who, he doesn't have voicemail and he uses a flip phone and he's never sent a text message in his entire life and I think he's like 35. Um, and it's just a boundary that he set for himself in order to, um, to, to create that balance. So um, I think one of the most important things is just being cognizant of what works for you and um, making sure that uh, you're authentic in it and that it, um, it works for you so you don't get a completely bumpy wheel. I would say that um, work life, when I was in law school and I would meet with attorneys uh, and in class we talked about work life balance and I'm a visual, like in my mind I create pictures when I hear people talking and so I envision somebody with the scales and, and this is you're trying to balance work and life. And the more that I'm, I'm out in this world and working and growing, it reminds me more of the visual I see now. You ever see those folks who are like spinning plates? And it's like, this is like work and this is life. And then we often forget about this plate down here, which is like self-care <laughs> and like you as an individual and your health. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, you're getting both of these to work and then this one's dropping. And that's kind of what it, it seems like at times. And, uh, and so for me, I'm coming out of a phase where I'm thinking more about these things will do what they need to, but how am I creating those um, pieces, that infrastructure for that self-care component? How am I ensure, ensuring that my cup is full so that I can provide to others from the overflow in a healthy way? Uh, so I think that's, that's kind of where I am, figuring out how to keep these plates going but not dropping this one as many times as we tend to because when you have kids and a family and you have work, you're often focusing a lot on these and and your own self can tend to suffer a little bit. Mm -hmm. I really, I love that example of the spinning plates. And um, I, I think sometimes we get a little bit too worried about avoiding imbalance at all costs. And especially for newer attorneys, there are probably gonna be times that your life does not feel like it's in balance. And for short periods of time, I think that can be okay because sometimes those are periods where you're growing a lot, either personally or professionally. But I don't think any of us can maintain that, you know, for the, for the marathon. <laughs> um, you can do it for a short while, but you do have to be careful that it's not becoming just the way that your life is. And something that, that I've had to get better at over the years 
is if something comes up and I want to do something new that's going to add to my time commitments or add to my stress level, I have to identify something else that I'm going to let go. Because if I don't do that, I'm not going to be able to fully commit to either one of those things. Um, so I try to be really careful when I'm um, examining <laughs> you know, new opportunities that might come up to say, OK, if I do this, this means I'm not going to have enough time to do that other thing. Am I OK with that? And sometimes it's, yes, I'm OK with that for six months. I'm not going to be OK with that for three years. And being able to, to value opportunities that way and realize that time is a finite resource. There are only so many hours in the day. And even though you might like the idea of being able to do a ton of things at once, you just can't. Um, and you know, one point for me where that became really clear um, toward the end of my time that I was working at Dorsey, um, my ex-husband and I went through a divorce. And it became very clear to me that when I was dealing with trying to figure out what this post-divorce life was going to be like and how we were go going to make sure that the kids were taken care of and that everything else was falling into place, I could not have the same level of commitments to things outside of work. It had to be work and home and nothing else. And so it was really difficult, but for a period of time, I had to resign from you know, all of the organizations that I was active in and hand over things to other people because I knew for that short period of time, I had to just be laser focused on those two things because it was go going to take so much energy that um, it didn't make sense to be adding other things on top of it. And you know, as things got back to normal and we all got back on our feet and settled into new routines, I was able to gradually add those things. Um, and so now I think I'm back at that point where I have a lot of you know, commitments outside of work, but I'm careful about trying to select the things that are gonna bring me meaning and are gonna give me more energy and make me feel good about being a lawyer and how I'm spending my time and be cautious about agreeing to things that, are, that feel like they're going to weigh me down or take time away from other areas that I want to be able to put my energy. Okay. Well, Cedra, Amanda, Aaron, and Elizabeth, thank you so much for sharing your stories here today, and thank you for being with all of us. At this time, I would love to invite Sarah Demers up to the podium.